Professor Sasanka Pereira. Thank you so much for joining us for the second Katikawa program. Um, the reason, uh, first, just to, everyone knows who you are, but just to recap, you're a professor of sociology, and at the moment, um, the dean of the Faculty of Social Science South Asian University in New Delhi. So thank you for joining us while you're in India through the Zoom, uh, Zoom link. And the reason I called you is to answer what I think is a very vital question that needs to be discussed in Sri Lanka right now, which is, is it possible for any academic or anyone to involve themselves in academic research without knowing English, right? And I want to start it from a post-colonial angle because all of us, whether we are Sri Lankans or whether we are Indians, have gone through the colonial process in which native knowledge, the knowledge that we had within our region before the Englishman or the Western people came here, which was quite profound, quite impactful, and which was denigrated, which was looked down upon by many colonial masters. Now, one of the best examples which Harshana Ramukpala had brought up in his recent essay, which I discussed last month, was Macaulay, the government servant who said, uh, or even if you collect all of the books in all the libraries in India, in the Eastern world, it will equate one shelf of good English books. Mm -hmm. We have come through such a history in which we were made to feel incredibly inferior. Yeah. So the question is, in our request or by the current idea that we really need to know English, should, should we want to proceed with our academic research, are we continuing a stereotype that was put in place during the colonial times? Or is it something that we cannot possibly ignore? Mm. Not actually continuing a stereotype, but knowing the falsity of what he said. Is there an in-between space or a middle mm. in which we can stand? And what do we do when we have to tackle that sense of inferiority that we were given? Mm. We learn the language of who had been the oppressor, right? Mm. We want to continue on the academic journey. Mm. I want to ask you, and now uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> to begin with, I will, I will not take Macaulay uh, too seriously, simply because, you know, he's a man of complete ignorance. Uh, and I think uh, it was self-evident at that time, as it is even clearer today. So, they, they, you know, but, but it, it places in context a certain kind of attitude that, uh, that was prevalent at the time. And I think in certain ways prevalent even today. And I'll come to that a bit later uh, maybe, uh, among our own people sometimes, but, um, but also elsewhere. Um, now, to come to your question, <clears throat> See, there was no confusion that uh, even at uh, Macaulay's time or a little bit later, that uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, very useful knowledge uh, was produced in this part of the world as elsewhere, but particularly in this part of the world because um, writing had already been established for a very long time. So there were texts, right? Um, there were texts that were written and um, that had survived um, over the years. So, um, and I, I mean, a very simple example is the kind of work that uh, uh, scholars like Max Muller and so on and so forth um, and um, uh, put into translating Pali uh, and also Sanskrit texts to English and French and German over time. So that is the exact opposite of the attitude of uh, Macaulay. And that was, uh, you know, these were these were particularly the work of the Pali Tech Society. The, 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 it, certain kinds of knowledge uh, from these old uh, languages in our part of the world come to us because of the efforts of those kinds of people and that kind of organization, right? So, um, so Macaulay is uh, is a is a kind of an irritant, I would say, in this scheme of things, which I will not take very seriously. Uh, but uh, I would rather take seriously the kinds of people who surpass that kind of intellectual limitations and racism, I would say. Um, so uh, now coming to the present, 
See, there are a couple of things we have to uh, take into account. Now, if I am asked, can an academic in a university in Sri Lanka, who's proficient only in uh, Sinhala or Tamil, can be an academic in that system with a PhD and teaching and all that, I would say yes. But I would say he will be a very mediocre academic. I mean, let's not be confused about this. And that mediocrity will come because um, he or she will be completely close to other kinds of knowledges, including about his or her own uh, subject. Uh, now, uh, let's take a very uh, limited example. If a person is uh, a scholar of Sinhala, uh, obviously we assume that he or she will be researching into that language, its history and its social, uh, cult cultural background and so on and so forth. But then I don't think it is any longer possible or it is pragmatic even or even reasonable to assume that a, a scholar of Sinhala can look at the history of Sinhala language merely through Sinhala. Because uh, for one thing, uh, Sinhala has to be located in a larger historical and cultural context. And most of the valuable historical and cultural material on Sri Lanka is not even written in Sinhala. It's mostly in English um, by scholars who don't even live here, who didn't live here. So that is one problem. The second is that if you, even if it's about language, you also have to look at the histories of related languages, uh, languages that have influenced us, uh, starting from Tamil, uh, Sanskrit, Pali, and so on and so forth. Now, those kinds of languages, the histories of them are also not written in Sinhala. So, so if a Sinhala scholar tries to write and research about the history of his own language without referring to these sources, then his work will be marked by a very serious sense of poverty intellectual poverty. Now, the only way in which you can make sure that this knowledge is not poverty stricken is to get hold of a tool, which in my mind is the language that will allow you to cross to these other discourses that are not in our language. So to me, it's a tool. So the short answer to your question is in today's context, we have to capture, um, <laughs> we have to uh, master the languages of the former oppressors, because now it is our choice. Earlier, we did not have a choice, right? By and large, we did not have a choice uh, because edu the, the more useful education was uh, in uh, English. And if you want to go further into the civil service, into uh, go abroad or any of those kinds of things, then you had to capture, uh, you had to master the language. Today, it's not the case. Uh, right. If someone really loves research and is a true <clears throat> follower of knowledge and he simply didn't have the background which helped him learn English, what would you suggest that he do? Because this is not a given for the mm. majority of Sri Lankans. I'll just refer to the Sinhala people at the moment. Yeah. It's not easily accessible, right? Mm. And I thought a love for being knowledgeable. Mm. How would he overcome this bar barrier as, as you think? Yeah, I mean, I can say what 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 has worked for me, and uh, and therefore also what ideally should work for the scholars or the academics or even regular people who want a certain kinds of knowledge. Um, if you wait uh, until everything in your field is translated into Sinhala or Tamil, that day will not come. Uh, particularly in our kind of country, where uh, even though uh, the the shift from English to Sobhasha in the 1950s uh, came with a lot of preparation, planning in place to translate, uh, to, to create these uh, bilingual glossaries and essential textbooks in Sinhala and Tamil. That never really continued uh, well beyond the first decade. Uh, so, so that plan didn't really keep up uh, with the times, right? So therefore, we are in a situation now that even though the shift to Sinhala and Tamil uh, uh, was implemented very quickly, uh, all around, uh, from schools to universities and so on and so forth, um, you uh, the, the kind of intellectual infrastructure that should have followed, like uh, textbooks, like um, other kinds of uh, research material in our languages, didn't really happen, right? 
so that is, so if you wait for that uh, to for, if if you wait for knowledge that you need to come to you from your own language my sense is it's not going to come particularly because our kind of country can now no longer even afford the process because we have we are so far behind that imagine the first 100 years uh, of knowledge uh, if you if you try to fill that gap first uh, it will be another 100 years when you come to today so this is this is not going to happen right yeah. it's impossible because knowledge is fast like, it is it does it does uh, yeah translations because by yeah. the translated book comes to us that yeah. obsolete mm. so, so quick when you take literary whatever it's still important mm. but mm. the speed of movement is something that we cannot get unless yeah yeah example of japan and china professor mm. in the um, interview how is the situation in other countries that can afford this see uh, well, um, I think it has succeeded uh, in places where there has been political stability and as a result, um, also um, uh, stability in long term planning. Uh, and Japan and China in the in the East are good examples of that, but it's also the case in, 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 in the West. Uh, I mean, uh, if you take our former colonial uh, uh, master, now quite a lot of the material in social sciences and humanities we use uh, in terms of theory and philosophy uh, has not come from uh, English language writers. They have come from the French and the German. But then uh, within the first, um, I would say, 10 years uh, or so of the publications of most of those things, whether we are talking about people like uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, the anthrop French anthropologist, or uh, Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, um, or even the theorists like Jacques Derrida and um, uh, Michel Foucault, these kinds of characters, their knowledge has been very rapidly available in English. And that obviously has, uh, and that was not as part of some government program. I mean, this is not the case in Japan too, by the way. Government, uh, what they did was they made funding available and certain kinds of capacities. But these were things done by individuals and entities. And there were publishing houses uh, in Europe and Japan, both willing to publish these things. And there were a lot of takers. So these are two examples from two different parts of the world where knowledge has been made available immediately. And in the case of uh, England, uh, that tradition has been going on for a very long time. Uh, now we know that if you take creative uh, work, the uh, first translations of Jalaluddin Rumi, for example, the 13th century uh, Persian poet, uh, was in, um, uh, in into European languages was probably in the first part of the 19th century or probably later 18th century into German and French. But in English, uh, they appeared in the 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century. So what I'm trying to say is when it comes to translating things that they think are important into their language languages, then there has been a very long tradition in that part of the world. And I think that tradition itself is important, whereas we don't have that. Right, we don't have that tradition, but uh, but the but having said all this, I think if somebody is serious about knowledge, now I make a very uh, distinctive difference between knowledge and being in a university because for us uh, in our system, you can be in a university without really advancing knowledge. I mean, that's that's the bottom line, right? You can repeat what your teachers have said, and you can you know I mean you know what I'm talking about. But if you're serious about knowledge, then you have to acquire that tool, uh, the language, what, whatever language, it doesn't have to be English. It depends now, if it's my discipline, I would find it useful to uh, have uh, French as well uh, and German. And, and that is why I studied German uh, for my A-levels. It is on the strength of that, that I went to university, right? It's a different matter that I'm losing that language. I can still read, uh, but not necessarily speak, but it was useful. Uh, because I could then read uh, Goethe and so on and so forth without going through the English translations, right? So the bottom line is that if you are serious about knowledge and if translations are not coming to you regularly, then you have to acquire language uh, well, um, strongly and without any reservations, a language that is useful for you to acquire the kind of knowledge you need. Now, it doesn't have to be English. 
easiest is English in our country because uh, there are better opportunities to learn it even in private, right? Uh, but without that, I don't think you can be a reasonable scholar or reasonable professional of any kind. Uh, How would you suggest that somebody who wants to be a researcher go about it? Because something that you said in um, the Singhala interview was that it wasn't easy for you either. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so what kind yeah. of, given that there is a love for research, there's a love for learning, what hmm. kind of methods would someone use, say from a very far away village, um, hmm. to acquire this? Yeah. It's like this. Now, I, I am no longer sure uh, how good uh, English language teaching is in universities. I'm not sure because I just don't know. I, I'm not in touch. But my experience in my time is that that training was simply not good enough. Uh, even in the kind of schools I went, it was not bad. I mean, these were important schools. But, uh, but still, if I st stuck to that school knowledge of English, I wouldn't have made it. Uh, so that uh, so one shouldn't really depend on it. The only thing schools can do is to give you a certain kind of familiarity to the language, right? So that you know A for what it is and B for what it is, that kind of, you know, very basic uh, linguistic knowledge. Um, now, if it also doesn't come from, if help also doesn't come from home, which in my case did, uh, then obviously you have to have extraordinary drive to learn this from somewhere else. Now, in my case, even though the schools did teach it reasonably well, even though the home environment was positive, both parents uh, being able to speak English, we did not speak English at home of a kind of a nationalist linguistic decision. I mean, I'm not going to go into uh, <laughs> but the details, but what happened was that neither my sister nor I was uh, uh, fluent in English by the time we went to school, uh, way into uh, high school, right? And it was a big problem for my parents. They used to pay us 10 rupees if we spoke in English for one day, uh, and sometimes we'll take us to, uh, to see a film. So that shows the kind of dilemma they were in because of their own policy and because of the nationalisms of language that we had acquired from school. Uh, Gave in Singhala, where you said the parents did that because the uncle told me. Yes. <laughs> it just sounds a microcosm of what happened to Sri Lanka. It just it does. That's why I brought it up because these were all confused decisions. See, I am a complete supporter of the shift from English to Subhasha. I never had any confusion about it. Had to be done, should have been done, and should have been maintained well. The problem is that last part. We did not maintain it well uh, because if we maintained it well, these issues would not be coming up now. For example, we would be making uh, knowledge available in local languages or we would give our people a very strong background in English uh, or some other language, but English is easier. Now, if you take a couple of examples from the region. In the 1950s, the king of Bhutan made a decision that uh, the, that the medium of instruction in Bhutanese schools and universities will be English, right? And you remember the tiny kingdom in the middle, right up there in the Himalayas. And now that has paid off because whenever students come to my classes, I, I, I was so surprised that they were fluent in the language. I actually asked them, they are the ones who told me about this decision. So Bhutanese students do not have language problems as do ours. But Sri Lankan students, when they come to the same class, do have very serious problems. So because of that very sensible political decision, that doesn't mean that there was erasure of their culture, that there was erasure of the local languages that are uh, spoken in um, Bhutan. No, they all that, that's part of the deal. But they did acquire very good um, um, command of English. Uh, and with that, they could go to any university in India or anywhere else. So that is one example. Second example is India itself. Now, even though they also went through a kind of a shift to local languages, and it has been um, implemented differently. Uh, and, and some universities teach in whatever the, um, teach mostly in whatever the, uh, uh, the regional language is. But, uh, but the central universities, 
which are funded by the central government, have more or less maintained their instruction in English. If you take Jawaharlal Nehru University and Delhi University, for example, everything is in English. Uh, 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 postgraduate, right? Undergraduate education can be in Hindi or whatever. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that unlike in our case, uh, there was always this space uh, for the maintenance of a language other than your local language. Right. And second, uh, unlike Sri Lanka, India also had India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all these three countries also had a fairly robust uh, academic publishing industry. So there was all this knowledge was produced, um, made and produced and distributed within the region and across the world. So, so that those kinds of things, I think these are these are the sorts of examples we should look at for inspiration of what to do, even though it's very late, but I still think it's not impossible. Uh, and second, I think a person uh, in academia or any kind of professional field that um, creates knowledge, not just service providers, I'm talking about creating knowledge, must acquire uh, a foreign language, a powerful foreign language for another reason. And that is because, see, knowledge would become powerful, and I always believe knowledge is a form of power, and if you want to exercise that power, then it has to go beyond the borders of your country, right? It can't be just a Sri Lankan thing. Now, I think in certain ways, <laughs> I am probably better read outside of the country than in Sri Lanka. And that is partly because most of what I write do not even come to Sri Lanka. And second, if it does, you know, uh, people can't or don't want to read it. So I, I think I am when it comes to <laughs> my writing, which is very unfortunate, I am better known elsewhere, uh, and, and precisely because of this. Backtrack, Professor. So one of the things is we did not have the infrastructure like publishing houses, which would have immediately, you know, translated yeah, yeah. So in real time. We didn't have yeah. that. And yeah. the thing that you said, you know, this is going to veer away from my initial question. Mm. Uh, when you said the, the decision to make the Subhasha was a good one. Of course, politically, the fact that they didn't do the same to Tamil led to enormous problems later. In fact, if they had only been single and Tamil, it may have avoided many problems. Which mm -hmm. But the fact is, I was thinking of your childhood and the fact that now you are proficient in almost three or four languages, right? When mm -hmm. initial input only in Sinhala, this is a popular theory that giving a child exposure to the mother tongue really does affect the brain very positively. And for me, you know, you're a perfect example of that. Mm. I'm veering away from, and I, neither of us are psychologists, mm. but for me, the fact that your childhood was mainly only Sinhala, your mother tongue, whatever, it could have been Tamil, had the decisions been different. Mm -hmm. If it into your mother tongue, is it possible that you're really going to advance more as an academic or an intellectual or even that, you know, even as a person. I know this is not our field, but mm. I, mean, I shouldn't get personal, but I wanted to ask you exactly what your uncle's children are doing. <laughs> no, no, they are all doing very well, but they are not proficient in single by and large. Uh, so that there was an issue. I mean, uh, <laughs> they're all doing well. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, some of them I have lost touch, but, uh, but the point is, uh, yeah. Hello. You're good in English, right? Yeah. You're yeah. German as well, you, though you may yeah. not. Yeah. So, yeah. There's something then for us to learn. Yeah. See, it's like this, Madhu. I, I, I also had a nationalist position. I still do have vestiges of that. And I think uh, I will still support um, people being educated in school and uh, high school in Singhala or Tamil. And I think uh, mastery of your own language uh, is uh, is useful. It's uh, if not necessary, it's useful um, because uh, through that you obviously um, uh, come into contact with uh, your cultural uh, setup that you will not be able to do through English. So I'm not confused about that, right? Uh, but I don't think that will necessarily broaden your uh, horizons as such. You know, I, for example, just because they've been educated in English uh, from uh, kindergarten right up to college, 
which is uh, undergraduate education, I don't think my Bhutanese students have lost touch of their cultural makeup, you know. Uh, they, I still learn quite a lot of their uh, politics and culture from these people, right? these young people. Um, so what, what it does is this. Um, if, you, um, if you see, let's put it this way. I think uh, single Tamil uh, kind of education uh, can be done uh, in our schools, uh, schools up to, let's say, let's say up to school. <laughs> Uh, end of school, like A-levels kind of thing. But it has to be done along with a very robust training in some other language too. That will give access to the world. It can be French, it can be German, Russian, or English, because you know you might as well get something from the colonial setup. No, I mean, it's been given to us, but what choices do we have? If we were colonized by the French, we would have uh, acquired that. But uh, so anyway, these are historical realities, no? So I think the, the way it was done in India, at least for upper classes, uh, that uh, you know you you had a um, uh, you had the choice of even if you studied in Hindi in North India, if you go to a central university, you would have there's no choice. You would have had to acquire English to go beyond that. But the infrastructure was available by and large. Not everything was uh, put into Hindi, right? Um, that is why these um, um, postgraduate classes were always in English in most of the major universities, um, most of the major central universities. Now, we didn't do that, but we did it for the sciences. Uh, to a large extent, the medicine was hardly taught in Singhala. I mean, there were parallel classes in the 70s, for example. Uh, I think now even uh, in most universities, sciences, other sciences, natural sciences are probably still taught in both languages. I'm not sure, but there was a time this was done, but it's only in the social sciences and humanities where this was complete. I think that was the mistake that uh, we should have gone into uh, local language education along with a very strong component of English language training so that you have that language as a tool uh, that will allow you to acquire the kind of knowledge that was simply not available in your own. That's yes. all. Right? Bilingual education from beginning. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes. yes that, that's, you know, either of these for practical um, purposes, because I know the, 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 you need to have teachers first. Yes, yes what we discuss here may not even be implemented but just knowing the problems that happen and knowing the positive way in which you look at local language education i think still is a lot of food for thought i think so it's so interesting professor one thing that you said about okay if your parents because of the nationalism going on around at that time didn't speak with you in english how did you improve the language what methods did you use because your story is not similar to Professor Amarakirti's story. Mm -hmm. Last month, when yeah. you, you said you also had to struggle and it was not easy for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's like this, not that they didn't speak. Uh, they, they, uh, they took that decision, which they regretted it uh, very soon. Uh, because when they saw the difference in language acquisition between me and my sister on one hand and her, and her brother's children on the other. <laughs> I, I always found it very amusing towards the uh, towards later times, but but because it didn't do any harm. I'm, for example, I'm teaching in English now. So is my sister in Australia. So I mean, it didn't uh, no big deal at the end of the day, right? But this is not what happens uh, generally because you do lose uh, if you lose the bus, you lose it. <laughs> we didn't lose it in that sense. But it was difficult uh, for me to be fluent in uh, spoken English because of this situation. Same applied to my system, much worse, right? But of course, we have both overcome it. And because, you know, fluency in uh, using a language uh, uh, to speak will come from practice. That practice was not available of, because of a political family decision, right? But, uh, but we were always encouraged to read in any language. Uh, we were brought a lot of books in both languages, in Singhala and English. So we got used to reading, uh, you know, simple things. 
and also at that time the schools that i went to did give a reasonable introduction to english as it did to other subjects so that you had that basic background grammar and syntax and all that kind of stuff but it was still tedious so what i'm trying to say is that if i only stuck to my uh, kind of politically challenged uh, family circumstances when it comes to using language and uh, and the kind of very dry english language instruction that is given in schools then uh, i'm not sure what my outcome the outcome for me would have been so the difference for me is because of that interest in reading that came from the family is also something that i truly acquired right. and uh, and this is from a very early age i uh, we got used to the practice of going to the british council uh, in colombo um, and uh, you know bringing books that i mostly didn't understand uh, at one time but they were they looked nice you you know you want to carry these books in the bus no to show people that yeah you know i had these heavy books so see the titles are in english you know there all these uh, peer pressures also, also probably helped in some sense but in the end i also ended up reading these things because i was not going to read this uh, you know like uh, chaucer or shakespeare these kinds of utterly boring things which i still don't find particularly interesting but i found this you know i forget these writers even in it like i i can't really think of reading her now but at that time and uh, there were lots of uh, these writers who who actually created that interest and also gave me an introduction to the elegance of the language that i could actually master this as i had already mastered singing now if it's not for these detectives and these children's books uh, you know early on this lady bug series that lady bird or lady bug i forget what it is you know that my parents tried to introduce me because <laughs> their policy had not worked um these kinds of things gave me an uh, very um, rapid um, entry into uh, the the world of english language reading professor say uh, that there was is no economic strength to support the buying of books but there are libraries even mm. now are free for people and they yeah, yeah 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 right? no our public library system is not bad uh, even if it's an old book now i we never our parents bought us books only during for the birthdays or the singhala new year that's it to not be they couldn't afford this i mean these were both government uh, servants they, they and these are you know 1960 70s people were not stealing money from the state uh, at that time like they do now so they just had to survive on their salaries so we couldn't afford these things but that's why i said british council library the school libraries and there was a small private library in nugegoda where i went and borrowed this uh, you know this detective novels along with my my mother also went with me most of the time she also read those things uh, and um, so and none of these things cost uh, a lot of money i mean the public libraries cost nothing this okay. private thing uh, cost some measly amount i mean very reasonable i've been to so, the library very little british council is costly now but yeah yeah library still exists it still has really, uh, you should worry about british council it's it's uh, right now there are so many other choices uh, okay. i think yeah lanka and the network of libraries right now this is what yes. the also referred to they are still very good mm. so maybe if you can someone can listen just getting the ya the youth literature mm. carry for yeah. that Ooh, that would be a lovely idea yeah 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 Yeah. and now uh, madhu there are a lot of things that are available uh, even without going to the library there are lots of things online uh, if you don't mind reading on your phone or on your computer or get a print out from somewhere you can the options are much much wider now much uh, much broader so the, the there are hardly any excuses uh, nowadays if you have an interest but you have, you must have that interest uh, <clears throat> so professor if we just wrap up by you know this my question about inferiority and nationalism and learning english just to refer to a, the two giants at the beginning of singhala literature professor edrivira sarachandra and then martin vikramasinghe mm. and they were bilingual as well and then you were giving examples of people who wrote the ancient siddhat sangarava whatever they were not monolingual they knew mm. or sanskrit that we mm. come from a culture which hasn't been monolingual mm, mm, mm. so this is no no yeah yeah 
I think uh, monolingualism will simply um, eradicate any sense of creativity or scholarship that is possible. You know, you will end up being very ordinary. Uh, and uh, and if you if if your goal in life is to be ordinary, it's very fine. You know, you just stick to your single or Tamil, and you'll be ordinary. But then in the university system, of course, being ordinary is not a, such a big problem because you'll still be a professor, you'll still be a vice chancellor. All those things will work. And so this has to do with knowledge and the drive for knowledge, because that if you have that kind of drive, then you have to find ways to acquire that knowledge. It cannot be done. Um, so what I said about these older singular grammar texts like Siddhar Sangara, you know, these people, I don't know what languages they spoke, but um, they couldn't have read it. Uh, they couldn't have written this without understanding uh, Pali and Sanskrit grammar as well. So they would have read it from somewhere, uh, probably in Sanskrit. Right. So, and also we know that when you come to the Piravana education in the in the in the court period, I, my recollection is that a number of languages were taught in the Piravanas. You know, and and you see that uh, the, when you see the erudite nature of the the poetry that came from some of the monks, uh, like the Sandesha uh, poetry. You know, these guys knew a lot about um, not just Sinhala, but the ways in which to use the language in terms of syntactic structures. Uh, they knew about the particular form of poetry that they had adopted, which was also available in India, what we call India today. Uh, so uh, there must have been some knowledge exchange. Now, I don't know how that happened, but, there, but, but these were not people who were limited in terms of their interest in acquiring knowledge. So this is the, this is, this is the pre-modern past we are talking about. Our history is not of monolinguism. That's the thing. Our history ah, is ah. of no, no. knowing no. languages. And yes, yes. For example, even if you see, I think it's Girar Sandesha, where they describe the Piriven, as you say, mm. they also give the subjects that are being learned. And yes. that's the languages. So yes, yes, it does. it does. And also, if you look at the Candian period, which is where we have most uh, evidence, written evidence. You, it, it is an incredibly cosmopolitan place, which is unthinkable for me today. Sri Lankans don't even want to accept that they are cosmopolitan. In term, I mean, I'm talking uh, about Candian Kingdom in terms of both uh, culture, religion, and um, you know, fashion, uh, and also ethnicity. Incredible numbers of people who live there with uh, religious freedom and all. I mean, these our times, these things uh, didn't work and go wrong. But then those are exceptions. But uh, but that cosmopolitanism in cultural and ethno-religious terms is also no longer part of our memory. Yeah. You know, we think that we were you know there were these uh, the Sinhalese were here before, and then suddenly the Tamils came. Ah, this completely misunderstood um, history of peopling of our country too. Right. Right? If we talk about history, that's another discussion altogether. Mm. Mm. So yes, yes. English language framework here. Mm. Mm. Knowing, you know, I can't say the true because true is also a relative term. But yeah. what that actually happened might be helpful in for us to chart the path this country can take. But mm restrict our conversation into like language learning and English. Professor, yeah. thank you so much because you showed two things. One was that without English, you know, there is no, whatever the history of how we got it, you can't advance in knowledge without knowing another language, not necessarily English. Maybe yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Whatever, monolingualism helped, Sanskrit, mm. whatever. But because the modern world moves with the more modern languages like English mainly now. Earlier it was German for science, you know, literary theory it was French. But because mm -hmm. at the moment and we were colonized by the English, maybe you should learn it. If, mm -hmm. you it. if you are willing to work hard, it might be tedious. You can make it fun by reading nice, you know, love stories, detective novels. There is a path for anyone, forget academics, for anyone who wants to learn the subject learn to read, learn to write in it, there is a part which is difficult, but can be taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for showing that monolingualism wasn't our inheritance anyway. Mm -hmm. Think about it in more positive terms. 
So I'm extremely grateful, Professor, that you came here to speak. It's such an honor for me to have you. And now, because it's on YouTube, anyone can access it anytime. So that is why I'm so keen, because I have heard y'all before to have this recorded for anyone. Good. To okay. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, Madam. It's good to be here. Thanks for doing all these things. You, uh, you. I mean, it's good that you have the patience to do this sort of thing because uh, someone like me obviously don't, but I don't mind helping anytime. So have a good day. Huh? Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> you take care. Yeah.